So throughout the discussion today, we're going to put a couple of polls up uh, just to kind of get a feel for what kind of an audience we're talking to today. If you click on the poll, it'll go away. It'll get out of your way once you click on it. So uh, it'll pop up just kind of randomly a couple times throughout throughout our discussion. We look forward to hearing a little feedback about who was interested in, in coming in and being a part of our discussion today. So what I'd like to do is first of all, just welcome you all here today. I know you have a lot of other places you can be. Uh, so what we'd like to do as, as a, a company, Intercept, welcome you to our pilot episode of Intercept U Presents, uh, a live webinar. This is our first uh, live discussion that we've had. We do have a number of videos on our site and on YouTube. And so I'm gonna say this before I forget because our, our web guru has reminded me numerous times, don't forget to encourage people to go to our YouTube site and subscribe. By doing that, you will be able to, you'll get updates uh, on these programs. And we're planning on doing this program about every other week for, for the foreseeable future. And we'll get into specific topics. And so we'll be able to send emails out to all of you and let you know what we're gonna be talking about specifically as uh, a little bit of time goes on. But what we thought we would do today is kind of introduce ourselves. First of all, my name is John Goals, and I'll be your, your moderator and, and host today of this show. And the reason I use the word moderator is because we're, we want this to be interactive as we go on. Now for the first uh, segment, you're just gonna hear me yammering on, you're gonna hear me talking some, but then we'll get into some of the questions, some that you have sent in and some that you can send in now. If you go to the chat feature on your, and on your Zoom page, you can send um, questions to Mandy. How did Mandy, is she, is she shown as Mandy? Oh, Ask Mandy, that's how she is, is listed. And so you can send questions to Ask Mandy. And if we don't get a chance to get to them today, because we're gonna try to keep this whole presentation to, to a half hour, because everybody has things to do. Um, so if you don't get a chance, if we don't get a chance to address your questions, uh, we can talk to you later. Uh, we can hang around afterwards and have and continue the discussion, but we want everybody to feel comfortable to be able to log off after a half hour. Usually a half hour of screen time is, is plenty for most people. So what we'd like to kind of establish today, rather than getting into a lot of the nuts and bolts of intercept structural insulated panels, we'd like to talk about us and what, what got us here to talk to you? What motivated us to stand in front of a camera, me in particular, uh, what route did I take to be standing in front of a camera during a polar vortex out, right? It's, it's nasty out. Uh, talking to you about structural insulated panels. Well, to give you a little bit of my background and my vantage point of where I'm coming from, I have spent most of my career out in the field um, with the really cool tools and, and, you know, with a hammer in my hand most of the time. I, about 20 years of that was doing drywall. Um, I spent about three years of my life working into uh, the drywall field, and then I spent the next 17 years trying to get out, and it, it, it finally happened. 2008 came along, and we all know what happened to the economy in 2008, and all of a sudden, the issue was forced a little bit. I needed to find something a little bit different, because what we were doing with the crew that I owned was primarily, almost, almost exclusively new construction. And in 2008, new construction took a, a serious hit. And so now all of a sudden we're looking for something else. So one of my general contractors that I work with on a regular basis, he and I started talking about looking into something that's not recession proof because there's really no such thing, but more recession resistant than what we were doing. Uh, new construction, spec homes, uh, the, the standard order of business that we both had been doing for a long time. And that's when we were introduced to Intercept. And it really caught our attention. And from that point on, the bulk of my uh, involvement in the, in the professional field has been with Intercept, with building uh, Intercept structures. So for the next number of years from 2008 on, I and, I and my crew, we went out building and shelling up Intercept SIP homes and, and shops. And it's, it, it's interesting that there was, a, there was a shift at that point in my clientele. Now, I've taken a lot of pride in my work. 
uh, well, my drywall crew, they were good. They, they knew what they were doing. We had a good reputation. We did parade homes and we had good referrals. But now instead of just having people who were willing to be referrals, all of a sudden I started building, building this client base that was asking me to, re to, to refer people to them. Please send people to talk to me. It was, a, it was a different mentality, a whole different attitude. And I started to try to figure out why, what was going on. And it wasn't just that they were, they were coming with energy bills and saying, hey, look how much money we're saving. They were coming with stories and they wanted to tell their story. Now, these clients, some of them would call me to tell me how well their, their building was, was performing. Others would actually pay to get into the home show or trade show that we met at. And they would stand in my booth, similar to this, and talk to the attendees, just beaming with pride. They just, they just couldn't say enough about how happy they were with the structure. Now, as I mentioned, I had happy customers in my drywall business, but I never had had this level of customer. So I started really digging into what is it about this that people are so happy with the decision they made. Now, today, my primary audience that I'm addressing is you builders. The, the, those of you who are looking for ways to make that really happy customer clientele list, the type of individuals that brag about you. All of us in the construction field are very familiar with the homeowner talking about when this project is over, we're gonna have a party and we're gonna invite all the subs and all the, you know, everybody that was involved in it. And generally speaking, by the time the project is over, they're all sick of seeing <laughs> the subs. They're sick of seeing the general. That party very seldom actually happens. So how do we build a client base that really is that excited about what they did and, and, and the, the route that they took? And especially when they're going off the, off the rails a little bit, uh, this is not what grandpa built. This isn't sticks. Uh, this isn't two by fours. It's not two by sixes. This is a different, a, a different, uh, animal that we're talking about here. And so why is it that they're so excited? They're so happy with what they're doing. Well, it's interesting. Like I mentioned, they came to me typically with stories uh, and they started with during construction, you know, during construction, we got it shelled up. We got the windows in, we put a torpedo heater in the basement and the thing hardly ever ran. Once it heated the building up, it just held the, the, that temperature consistently. Or I'd go up on scaffolding to do plaster work and it wasn't any hotter up there. The, 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 the consistency of the air temperature throughout the building was remarkable. Just about three weeks ago, I got a call from a gentleman. He says, I built 2,500 square foot houses in Alaska. And he built them with intercept sips. And he says, on average, he says, we would build them so that we could get inside during the winter. They worked in Alaska. They wanted to get out of the weather you know, during the winter. He says, we got, once we got them shelled up, it, it took about a gallon and a half of fuel a day to keep them at a consistent temperature for us to work inside. Those are the type of stories that people came to, to us with. And that was just in the construction phase. <laughs> that was just in the, in the starting part of their project. Then they would call me or get a hold of me or come to my booth and tell me about now that we're in the building, uh, this is how it's functioning. Uh, like I say, occasionally one would bring a uh, an energy bill, a gas bill or electric bill. But usually it was, I got to tell you about this. I've got to tell you how this building is functioning. One Amish man, just a few miles from here. I'm, I live in Southern Wisconsin and most of the SIP houses that I built have been in the, in the Wisconsin, Illinois, uh, Michigan, some in Iowa area of the world. So we built a, a, a building for an Amish gentleman and he has new, new furniture with new finish on it. And that finish has to stay above 50 degrees for two weeks while it cures. So we built him a building and he put a space heater in it. But being Amish, he didn't have electricity in the building. He had gas lights. And he, he comes to my booth one day at a show where he was working that, that as well. And he says, in the history of that building, I have never turned the furnace on, that, that heater on. As long as I keep one gas light on, it stays above 50 degrees in that building. And he just, he just couldn't believe it. He was so excited about the decisions that he made. Or one day I got a picture and it was just a picture of a house with snow on the roof, you know, this time of year. 
And the gentleman says, I have to tell you, what we did in that particular house was we tore off the existing roof and put a new roof on with panels. And he says, I've owned this house for a long time. I've never had snow on my roof more than two days after the snowstorm. And it says it hasn't snowed in over a week. And look at all the snow up there. That's how the heat is being held in into our house. So it's, that's the type of stories that started to build. And I started trying to figure out why is it that these clients are so excited about the stories. Now, I'm talking to you builders, but if you're here as a homeowner or somebody that's a prospective home builder uh, for your own home, you can appreciate this as well. You can appreciate the fact that you want to be excited about the decisions that you're making. And what I discovered is most of our customers, most individuals that are building a home, they don't care about building the, the biggest and the most square feet per dollar and the blingiest house out there. What they are concerned about is making intelligent decisions that they can be proud of. And if they're gonna go off of the traditional route, they're really concerned to make sure that these decisions make them look good. And that's what we have with Intercept customers. That's what I started to get excited about with the individuals that I was talking to. And it wasn't always just the energy efficiency aspect of things. Sometimes it was coming me and talking about how quiet the house was. You know, the storm moved in. We didn't even hear the, the storm moving in until the rain started. Uh, it, it's so quiet. Or uh, the, the architect who talked about the building process itself. And he came out and worked with us as we built his cabin up in Door County, Wisconsin. And he, he wrote down a, a testimonial and he said, working with this crew and building my own cabin was like adult summer camp. <laughs> he says, everybody should be involved in this. Another one was a family that they, do, they homeschool their kids and they used their, their construction project as part of their curriculum. And they said it made sense. It worked. Uh, the kids learned so much and they could do it themselves. And they were very excited about that as well. So there's all of these various facets of this construction process that really make people excited. It helps them to be proud of the decisions they've made and they wanna tell other people about it. And it is the most fun as, as a sales guy now, four years ago, I became a full-time sales rep for Intercept. And it is the most fun when you're doing a show and one of your past customers walks into your booth and kind of moves you off to the side <laughs> and they start talking to people and they have a whole different freeness of speech because they don't have a vested interest uh, from the standpoint of making any money off of these, these clients that are standing there. They are simply there to say, this is what we did. This is why we did it. Another story. One of them was a, a, a cabin on an island in Canada. And I bring this one up because Everett is the, the homeowner's name and he still comes to that show every chance he gets. It's a show in Madison. And he loves coming in there and talking to my customers. Their big concern was how do we get panels five miles across the water? Or how do we get building materials five miles across the water? So they bought our panels and I actually, I went up there and helped them build it. And so they would bring a load of panels out and then I would, me and one other gentleman would install them. And their comment was every time we get back with another load of panels, you're ready for us. Another chunk of our cabin is done. And by the time they brought the last six panels out, we had six panels to go on their structure. And they were just thrilled about it and they love it. And they gave me a key to their cabin. Uh, I, that, was, that was a nice perk. So I've been up there a couple of times. That's what we're looking for. That's, that's what we want with our own clients. And that's something that I had never experienced at that level. And that's what motivated me to be so bold about this as to stand in front of a camera and talk about it. As I mentioned, my drywall crew, I was proud of those guys. I was proud of the work that we did, but it was a, a different level of, of excitement that our, our clients with, at Intercept bring to us. Is it because it's, it's perfect and there's never a flaw and nothing ever goes wrong? No, That's, it's, there's a, this is a real world. You know, Things happen that we have to work through on occasion, but this is a consistently fantastic way to build a structure. It's a consistently fantastic way to build an energy efficient shop, house, uh, office building, whatever project you have in your future. This really works. I ran into a friend 
we built his, his shop, it's 40 by 70. And I asked him, what's it costing you to heat this? And he's got in-floor heat. Uh, he keeps it at 62 degrees because it's a, a carpet cleaning shop. And he says, well, you know, January, it was pretty cold. And it cost me 65 bucks to heat it. And then he gets this kind of sheepish grin. Pretty proud of the decision that he made. Couldn't be happier with how this building is functioning. That's, that's what we want your customers to have. That's what we want you to have as far as a, a client base, or if you're a homeowner, it's what we, how we want you to feel about your house. It's a sacrifice building a house, right? You have to give something up. Um, very few of us just write a check and say money is no object. <laughs> we're, we're sacrificing there, but it's also the time and energy and, and, and all the decisions to make. We want, when you're done with that process, to be re you to be really proud of the building that you have. So in the last four years, I've had the opportunity to educate, explain and illustrate what a SIP uh, intercept structural insulated panel is all about. And then me and the team that I get to work with and that you can work with will help to facilitate your opportunity to have clients like that or to have a home that you're proud of. So not everybody in our, in our company has my background. They haven't all been out there in the field swinging a hammer for many years. They bring a lot of different things to the table that, that really are beneficial in helping you to be able to go through the, the, the business process of building homes, but also having that, that really happy client base. So we would like for you to build these stories and then share these stories with us because that that's, makes it exciting to go to work. So that's really what brings me here. And that's all I'm gonna talk about today. As I mentioned, I didn't really get into any of the nuts and bolts of, of structural insulated panels. We will in further, in future um, seminars, uh, webinars, we will talk about a lot of the, the specifics of how these buildings go together. The R values, the energy efficiency, the codes, the electricity, uh, the structural facets of these buildings. And we want you to keep your questions coming. What we are going to do today is Mandy uh, is my, my producer today. She's going to share some of the questions, and we're only going to cover a few of them. But if she's going to cover, uh, share a couple of the questions that people have sent in or chatted in, and I'll do my best to talk about these and uh, be as accurate as I possibly can as I give you some answers. So, Mandy, what's the first question we should talk about? Sure. So we've had several people ask about the sizing of an HVAC system how they how they take care of that as well as some concerns about moisture primarily on the inside of the home versus on the outside of the home sure thank you so we're building houses as tight as possible whether it's a sip house or a traditionally built stick house we are building them as airtight as possible because we know that our value is only one aspect of of energy loss right air infiltration is a big part of it as well if if we can heat it up and we can have great insulation, but if the air just goes right through it, then we're losing our, our heat or we're losing our cool. So we do everything we can to seal these houses up. And now when we start talking about an intercept SIP house, solid polystyrene in the middle of the, in the core of these panels, so I'll point to this one because you can see it, that really makes a tight structure. So now, one, how do you size the, the HVAC system? It's really important that you size it down to what's necessary for this building. The old standard is, oh, it's this many square feet. Well, you need this size system. You know, it's 3000 square feet. You need a hundred thousand BTU furnace and you need a four ton air conditioning system or whatever, whatever the rule of thumb is to make this work. That doesn't work with an intercept SIP house. That will be an overbuilt system and heating and air conditioning systems don't work well if they're overbuilt, especially air conditioning systems. Heating systems are more comfortable if they're running more consistently. So a smaller system that runs more often is more comfortable. An air conditioning system really doesn't even do its job if it's not running at capacity. And so it's important that we size them down. We can help your HVAC professional with that. Now, more and more of the HVAC professionals have software that helps them to size a system. But if they don't, we have contacts that do sizing um, at a reasonable, a very reasonable rate. But we can also help them, that your HVAC professional, even 
use their own software uh, as far as understanding how this works and building that system down. Mandy mentioned moisture, uh, interior moisture. If the, if the house isn't breathing, you know, is it too tight? If it's not breathing, does that mean the moisture is not getting out? Well, something that needs to be addressed. So we recommend an air exchange system uh, in every house that, that's built uh, with intercept SIP panels. The reality is some look at that as, oh, is that an added expense? The, the reality is every house that's being built today should have an air exchange system. We're building them all as tight as possible. Now, is there such a thing as too tight? Um, you know, if we don't open a door in time, is the pilot light on the, on the furnace gonna go out? No, <laughs> they're, not, they're not that tight. We don't run out of air in these homes, but we do want an air exchange occasionally. And we also want our air conditioning system to run often enough to dry the air out because our air conditioning system is a great dehumidifier. So downsizing the system is really the answer to that question and then putting an air exchange system in. Mandy, what's the next question? The next question I'm combining two. Um, and so the question is, they see that it's a vaulted ceiling. However, what do I do if I don't want a vaulted ceiling? And while you're describing that, if you could go ahead and also just show how the roof panels connect to the gable as well as the sidewall. All right. So let's talk about that idea of a vaulted ceiling. This is one of the the really cool aspects of an intercept SIP house is that we run, we buy, our panels are, can be up to 24 feet long from ridge to eave. And so generally speaking, this is going to be a glue lamp. Now on this model, it's an LVL and it's not all that beautiful, but we usually put a really pretty beam in here uh, that carries that, that roof panel and then it runs down to the wall. So um, let's see, the first one was, oh, the, the second one was how do they connect? What was the first one? The question was if someone didn't want a vaulted ceiling. Oh, doesn't want a vault. Thank you. <laughs> I blank just like that. So it's a, it's a beautiful thing that you can have a vault without having to go with scissors trusses or anything, anything extra. But if you have areas of your house where you don't want the higher ceiling, the vaulted look, you can build a drop ceiling in, a, structure, a, a wood drop ceiling. The important thing to know is the insulating envelope is going to be up here. And that's actually a good thing. Now, most of us grew up with the idea that vaulted ceilings are inefficient. And the reason for that is because heat, the heat rises and then it would go out through fluffy insulation and we'd lose it. And it's always 10 degrees or 15 degrees hotter up at the high part of the house. And we're losing all of that valuable heat. So we put ceiling fans in and try to drive that down, but it's still an inefficient system. Well, when you have an airtight system like this, stopping that air from, from leaving and filling the room with air. Now you can have that vaulted look, or even in a small home, you can have a loft above some center rooms because you don't have that, that airspace. But if you don't want that, you can drop a ceiling in, and especially in a slab on grade setting where you're trying to decide where you're gonna put the, the HVAC system, you can put a, a, a drop ceiling in, a, a fault ceiling in structure in a wood, but uh, um, it's not really bearing any load and you can put your heating and cooling system up above and it's still in a conditioned space. So if you have any water lines going through there, things of that nature, like I say, especially in a slab on grade system where you don't have a basement or a crawl space to run things under the house, you can run some, some of your mechanicals over the house. So as far as how these panels attach to the walls, as you can see, this is, this is a, a system where we have a top plate and a cap plate. The panel sits here, and this is what we call a SIP screw. The SIP screw goes all the way through the panel. This one's just a little bit long for this application, but it, I wanted the camera to be able to pick it up. And it comes down through the panel and into that top plate. The same is true on your gable ends, where we have top plates back here. The, the SIP screw goes all the way through, generally one foot on center down the gables, and across the eaves and on the, on the uh, ridge beam. That might vary from house to house, depending on the location, the, the wind, things of that nature. We built some in New Jersey a couple of years ago. We had to increase that because we tend in the Midwest to talk about load uh, and snow load in particular. Out there, they talk about lift. <laughs> 
because it's hurricane force winds. So all of a sudden it's a different, it's a different discussion. And so they had to increase the screws, the, the number of screws in order to meet the code there. But these actually qualify then as hurricane clips uh, when they're done according to the specifications and everything gets attached down. In this area, we send a wedge of, of foam and a wooden block that goes in here. All of that gets, gets put together. I always waited until after the electrician was done because he kind of liked using this chase here to, uh, to run some wires, especially if he had some low voltage that he could run in there and then it all gets sealed up. Mandy, what's next? The next question is, people are interested on how the panels connect at the corners, if you could show that. Hmm. Well, I do have a part of a flyby panel here. And so this is, this is what we call an intercept, a flyby corner. Now there's a couple of different ways to connect corners. One is just to have panels come like this. Imagine that there was a, a two by six in this end and the panel could come in like this and you can put SIP screws in, uh, shorter SIP screws in and tie it all together. The problem with that is it's a little trickier to get it plumbed and level and everything square. But what we use uh, typically is what we call a flyby corner where the outside OSB runs long. And now this panel comes in like this. And again, if we had the structure in here, two by six in here, now, in order to make this, this corner solid, all that has to be done is eight pennies, six inches on center, down, this, down through this flyby. One of the beauties of this is if your concrete isn't perfect, and for those of you who are builders out there, I can't see you right now, but you're laughing as I say if the concrete isn't perfect because concrete's never perfect. That's just a reality. So if there's a little bit of a out of square or um, the, the one, one wall is a little short or a little long, you can make an adjustment on this wall very easily. You can, you can shorten this or you can even, if, if your panel, if you need to stretch it, you can put your panel out like that and then fill this. So it makes a very adjustable corner that is, is easy to fit into the circumstances that you're dealing with. One of the concerns that people have with panelized, a panelized system is, is now that is everything written in stone, what if I need to make on-site adjustments? On-site adjustments can be made. We make them all the time. Uh, homeowners change their mind. Uh, something, something comes along that there needs to be an adjustment. Some of them are really easy. That cabin in, in, uh, in Canada, they, we got the house all built and <laughs> one of the owners of it was a pretty short lady. And she stood there at her window where her sink was gonna be. And she realized the, sink, the, the window was just too high. She couldn't see the lake. I mean, the whole idea was when she was standing there cleaning up and doing dishes that she should be able to look out in the lake. But she, the window came to about here. <laughs> And she was just heartbroken about it. Well, she was shocked to find out that I could just cut panel here and on the outside and slide it up and still had the same rough opening. Everything was, was good to go. And her window was exactly where she wanted it. Some of those adjustments are easy. Other adjustments, it's a panelized system. Other adjustments are more difficult. That's, that's reality, but we can always get it done. We always find a way to do it. And I talked earlier about the team that we have that's, that's there to back us up. That's part of that, that team. When I was out there new in the field building these, I, would, I depended on being able to call back to Watertown, South Dakota, to, to the, the professionals out there that had all kinds of background with these panels and say, this is the snag I run into. How do I get through it? How do I navigate this? And they'd walk me through it. I fell in love with that service and support. That's probably the thing that drew me to the camera more than anything. That drew me to this, this square that I'm standing in is having that type of a, a team behind me that was, that was there to, to help us get our job done. And when I had the opportunity to become a part of that team, it was a pretty cool opportunity. And it's, it's been a fun, a fun ride so far. I tell you what, that runs us out of time for 
what we asked you to come here for today. Uh, we don't want anybody to feel obligated to stay any longer. Um, we really appreciate you coming. We will have another program. We're planning on it two weeks from today. We'll let you know uh, by email what the subject is going to be, what specifically we're going to talk about. But we'll probably get into more of the the SIPS 101 aspect of how does what is a panel and how does it all go together and and what's the the pros and cons of building with with SIPS. But one way or another, we'll come up with the next uh, based on your questions and uh, opportunities to talk to you what we should talk about next. So anybody who would like to leave, we really appreciate you being here. Please feel free to contact Intercept at intercept.com and ask any questions, find your local uh, regional sales manager. I cover Wisconsin, Illinois, Michigan, uh, New Jersey, uh, and a few places out east, but we have uh, regional sales managers like myself all over the country that would be happy to follow up with you, answer your questions, and make sure that you feel comfortable with the decisions you're going to make. Anybody that would like to stick around and kind of do a fireside chat, if you will, um, maybe you could unmute your mics and start asking questions if you'd like to do it that way. You're certainly welcome to do that. We'll stick around as long as possible. What's that, Lauren? Oh, the raise hand feature. That might be the, that might be the way to go. If you notice down in the reactions at the bottom of the page, one of the options there is raise your hand. Um, it might be an, it might be best if you raise your hand. Uh, I don't know how many people, how many participants we have here today, but um, it might get a little chaotic if we all try to talk at once. Okay. <laughs> Hi, sorry. I got muted somehow. Um, so Claude, you have a question? You can unmute your mic and ask a question. Yes, I'm, I'm wondering about Claudia. the glue. How healthy is the glue that you're using when you're making the panels? The How, how what? Healthy. How good is the glue? Oh. The glue, that's a great question. You know, it's interesting. When we talk about SIPs, we generally talk about the foam and the OSB. Those are the primary components, but the glue is the lifeblood <laughs> of our product. That is what makes these a structural panel. And so the glue that we use, that's really, that's where the research and development money is spent, is to make sure that that glue is exactly the right product. The glue that we use is similar to Gorilla Glue. It's a water activated glue. And so when you go into our plant, the, as the panels go through the, the process, the glue gets drizzled on, and then there's a mist of water that gets sprayed on it. And then the top panel gets put on and in, into the press. While that's being pressed, that glue expands and it works into the nooks and crannies of the OSB and the styrofoam itself. In all of the years that we've been building panels, which goes back to 1981, we've never had a glue failure. That's something that we wouldn't, we don't take lightly. <laughs> we make sure that that glue is exactly what it needs to be. Even the glue that we used early on is still functioning well, and we've only gotten better uh, with what we're using. Okay, but it's not dangerous. As far as off-gassing or, right, nope, there's no, there's no uh, chemical reaction that we have to warn people about at all. Um, as a matter of fact, we can call our panels formaldehyde-free even the glue that's used in the OSB no longer has formaldehyde in it. Back in the day, there wasn't any option. Uh, glue had formaldehyde, the glue now doesn't. And so we can't, we can't say there's absolutely no formaldehyde because wood naturally has some, but there's no added formaldehyde in the process. And Thank so you. it is a, a safe product. You're welcome. Any other hands? <coughs> Stephen, you have a question? 
Can you guys hear me all right? Yep. Okay, good, good. Long time no see. How you been? Good, good to see you. Yeah, I've been uh, working my way up. The question I have is dealing with the subcontractors, um, especially in its, and I do have another question regarding on how the HVAC guys are measuring the houses to get the proper setup for the furnace in the AC unit. Um, case in point is uh, take my house. I did the sit panel foundations for the three car garage. Um, we had a lot of openings and it was just easier to do stick frame for the main level. It just, it was easier because we had openings in the front and the back windows, the whole nine yards. The second floor, however, is going to be the master bedroom. And that's where we are going to use the sit panels strictly for the walls, for sure. We're still trying to figure out as what we're going to do for the, uh, the roof. Um, the problem that I'm having is with the HVAC. So how do they determine that? And obviously the old way was done by, like you said, uh, by the square footage of the house but that so is not effective anymore. And is there a percentage? Yeah, it's actually, it, it, it actually starts boiling down to a cubic footage of the house at that point. So now they're taking the square footage by the, the height of the ceilings and, and working that into their programs. Now on your particular situation, if you have stick built on one level and, and sips on the next, uh, I don't know exactly how that, that would all work out. Maybe Joe can get involved. Otherwise, maybe the thing to do is to have uh, your rep follow up with you and, and talk to your HVAC professional and see what we can work out to, to get to the, the right place there. Um, we have a pretty good network of, of guys. Um, and I say guys because my HVAC guys are all guys. <laughs> I'm not working with any uh, female HVAC uh, um, professionals right now. But there's one in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. There's one in Evansville, Wisconsin. Both of them have a lot of background and, and, and the right software. And they're really helpful to me in helping people get to what you're talking about. Okay, how do we, how do we make this work out? Because I'll tell you, in the, one, of the, one of the challenges in this area is HVAC pros that want to overbuild the system just out of habit. Um, especially in the commercial yeah. world. Um, yeah. And it's, it's very common for them to overbuild the system. So we want them to get it right so that their building functions clean and, and dry and it, it's comfortable. So, um, so Joe, if you don't have anything to add, maybe the thing to do is to follow up with Steve. Uh, where do you live, Steve? I'm in South Dakota now. I was in Colorado okay. and that's where I started building the set panels was in Colorado. I mean, we were doing at 11,000 feet. So you talk about wind and yeah. cold. <laughs> we're talking 100 square, you know, 100 pounds per square foot for snow loads. Yeah. But um, then I moved out here to South Dakota and I've been doing a lot of remodel. I'm actually, I don't know if you can tell, but <laughs> I'm down in Omaha doing a complete house remodel. We complete gut out. What's that? What do you say? I, I don't, I don't, yeah, I think somebody anyway, else. Anyway, so I, I do travel. I mean, okay. I'm not just. Well, I, I think the thing to do, you, you got an email to this, to this seminar. And so talk back, but Roberta is the one probably that sent that out to you. Uh, send, right. send a, that note back to Roberta and we'll follow up with you and make sure that we can help you through some of those specific challenges. Um, so Joe, do you have something to add? I see your hands up. Yeah. As far as the, design of the structure from a mechanical standpoint, they'll use what's called um, manual J to actually run through the calculations for heat loads, both for heating and cooling on the building. They'll take into account the climate location, where the building is located, how it's situated, and then um, the R value for the walls and the roof system, as well as the windows and then once they've used or put all of that data into this manual J program, it, it's, um, there's a bunch of 
it's through ACA, the um, Air Conditioning Association, and it's a standardized way of, of determining loads on the building for both heating and cooling. And they'll use that information then to size what um, the furnace and air conditioning systems that are needed. And then they have another manual that you use to actually size the heating and cooling for each room based on its location in the building. So it can be a, um, a little bit onerous to go through and get the data all pulled together to make that happen. But that's really the only way that you can design um, a given building. And, and this isn't a one size fits all program in the sense that once you've done it for one building um, and you take that same building and put it in a different location, the calculations could all change because of the climate zone and the orientation on the site. So it's important that that information is fed to the person doing the design work on that. And as John indicated, we have we collaborate with multiple designers that are available to do that, and they've automated the system. So it's it's relatively cost effective to use them to get the right sizing of the equipment. What's the name of that program again? Well, Emmanuel J is the Manual J. You, John. Yeah, that's that's the, what the HVAC pros used to come to that conclusion. And it was interesting. I was talking to one pro. He was he was setting doing uh, a computerized Manual J, and he started out by showing um, two by six walls, R19 uh, fiberglass insulation, and his program showed a point five at a, at at resting, you know, not pressurized, just at resting. Um, 0.5 air exchanges per hour. And when he changed the SIPs, the program automatically changed it to 0 0.05 air exchanges per hour <laughs> resting. And he says that in itself, you know, knocked the size of that system down 20%. Um, just that one change in, in, in aerial infiltr in, infiltration, not taking into account our value, not taking into account thermal bridging, just air infiltration. That's a, a pretty powerful uh, um, testimonial to how well these buildings perform. Moto Z3. I don't know if you know who that is. You have a question, you have a hand up? Yeah, John, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, this is uh, Mike Collins, I'm out in Utah. I made a... Uh... I have panels scheduled for delivery in April. I was just looking for, uh, as far as site setup, uh, what is the recommended, uh, upon delivery, what is the recommended uh, setup? What's your experience on that? When it comes to staging the panels themselves, you also, it's nice if you have some room, um, the panels, um, are not going to come off the truck in order. Uh, I tease our loaders that they have a degree in Tetris because since our panels are fairly light, uh, it's never a matter of loading a truck until it's, it meets the weight limit. It's until it meets the cubic footage <laughs> um, limit on the truck. So in order to get as many panels as they can on the truck, they don't pay very close attention to the numbers on the panels. They look at the sizes and make sure everything fits together. And it's the funniest thing. You'll be unloading a truck and you get to this little gap in the middle between panels that there's this little hole and they put a box of clips in there or something is in there, a box of sealant uh, so that they can use as much of that space up as possible. So then when the truck comes, we like to see them off the ground. So if you can have some two by material or some something available that as you're taking them off, the ideal way to unload the truck is with a SkyTrack or telehandler um, lull. We all call it something different. Uh, that's the easiest way to unload the panels. Um, you know, get them on the ground and then start working at staging them as far as numbers go. And so often when I go to a job site, the first thing I'll do is go out to the panels that are sitting there and I'll just start rearranging the panels into the biggest numbers on the bottom. Um, and it doesn't matter if they're necessarily in order, as long as the biggest number in each pack stack is on the bottom, then you can just keep taking off the top of each pile for the next panel that you need on the deck. Once you start building, 
you can put a lot of panels on the floor deck. You know, you already have your deck built. Now you can move the, the panels up to the floor deck once they're, that they're not gonna be in your way and start laying them out up there. So does that help? Um, does that help you get, feel a little more prepared? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Okay, very good. And, and feel free again to reach out to your regional sales manager as well, and and he'll help walk you through. Uh, he or she? Oh, Utah. Who are we? I'm not, I'm not sure who covers Utah right now. It's Don. It's Don. Don. Okay. Well, then she'll help you with that process, and and be rough on yeah. her. Be as mean to her as you want to be. So. The greatest sales manager you have. <laughs> oh, no, no, don't go there. <laughs> she doesn't need that. <laughs> Thank All you, Mike. Right. John? Okay. Uh, can you hear me okay? This is John. Yep. yep. Um, does uh, Intercept have uh, home designs uh, or are every uh, uh, floor plans is something that the uh, client submits to you? uh to uh, have uh, kind of like custom made by by your company so i mean if you have a pre-designed home design something that you guys have have built maybe uh, several times before uh, do you have have that uh, kind of a service that you offer or, or do your customers just submit a floor plan to you and and what kind of a uh air change per hour type of number can you warranty with a, a new design or with with any design Sure. So let me let me cover that first one first. Um, we do have some package plans. We have some plans that we have designed that are, that are out there. Now you asked, is it a design that you know has been built a number of times over? And the reality is no, because nobody wants to do something that's already been done. <laughs> I think that's my safest answer. Uh, with our package plans, people will look at them and say, Oh yeah, 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 this is the one. I love this. Except I need uh, addition out here, or I need this smaller, or I need you know a, a ground floor laundry or whatever. And so every time we build our package plans, they get tweaked to the homeowner's needs. And so they haven't, that particular plan has not been built like a model home over and over again. But we do have some package plans that we can send out to you and you can look through them and, and there's some concept ideas and kind of, I always view them as, um, they kind of show you what can be done with SIPs uh, because, because of it being SIPs, you can put a loft where you couldn't if it was trusses over the top of it, or you can have an open concept uh, where you couldn't have if it was a stick built house because of, of the span capabilities and so on. So those plans kind of help you to see, okay, this is some things that can be done and this is, this is the starting point. We don't really have a design department in, in Intercept. We do have drafters. Our drafters are production drafters and 90% of what they're doing or more than that of what they're doing is taking the homeowner's plan and then uh, converting it to SIPs. Uh, sometimes a house comes in that's already designed with SIPs, but most of them are a house that's been designed with sticks and then they convert it over to SIPs. We do have collaborators. We do have some design professionals, uh, a couple of them that work by, by just a flat rate of you know, 80 cents per square foot or whatever their rate is. And they can give you an idea of what it would cost to design what you're looking for. You talk about exchange, air exchange rates, and we can't warranty anything because there's too many variables. Uh, for instance, the windows, uh, that's something we don't have control over. And uh, you know, a window is not a window, right? There's a big difference between a well-built window and an economy window. And that's going to affect the air exchange rate. Um, there's, there's other things. As far as what we can accomplish, our company, we own a blower door uh, to go out and do blower door tests. And man, it's fun. <laughs> it's so fun to go into a, a building and do a blower door test. And you know the the owner's expecting, man, if they can get uh, a 1.2 air exchange per hour rate, you know, at 50 pascals, they'd be they'd be thrilled. And it comes in at 0.8. Or uh, we had one recently that came in uh, basically passive house numbers 
just with a standard SIP built house, which is 0.6 exchanges per hour. Now we can't guarantee that because there's a lot more than just the panels that go into that process, but we're seeing it consistently with builders that are very concerned about making that airtight structure. One more. CSD builder. Unmute yourself. Okay. Yep. I got there it. You, you got me. Yep. Yeah. The name's Chris. John. I'm out in the Black Hills, actually, across the state from you. So we've got a customer that's wanting to build a hunting lodge. And, you know, we've, we do, like you say, we deal with some logics with some ICF and different things. And this isn't a fit and time frame is not going to work. So that's why the interest in your product, of course, I've got a question as far as cost effectiveness. I know long term with, you know, all the different things with the heating, cooling, all this stuff. How about just st traditional stick built comparison to what percentage more it's going to cost to go to the panel with you guys? That's an excellent question. And um, you're going to like and not like the answer to it. Uh, I I, I have always said, and I have always found personally, and, and my own, my boss, Joe, who's listening in, is, always hates it when I say this, but I'm going to say it anyway, because he's muted. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I have always found it's about five, about a 5% premium to build with SIPs um, on the whole project. It's, it uh -oh. ends up being about a 5% premium. Now, what you're not going to like about this, this <laughs> the, the good and the bad, right now it's not. Right now it's pretty similar because lumber prices have gone up so dramatically, SIP prices have gone up some. Lumber prices have gone up, you know, 60% and more. SIP houses, SIP panels have gone up about 15% uh, overall. So we've really closed the gap on, on that 5% increase or 5% premium that has existed. The bad news is it's because it's all more expensive. Yeah. That's, that's the downside. But it really, at right now to build, it's a, it's a pretty, it's a pretty tight margin. It really is. Um, it, it works out pretty slick. And you're absolutely right. And this is something that I, I explain to my customers when they're building a cabin, is we talk about return on investment. And even at that five to ten percent premium, uh, in a home that's being lived in, it still is only a five-year payback, which is pretty remarkable. But if you're not there all winter that payback is going to be a lot longer right? That's right. not heating it. That's, that's just reality. And I want my customers to know that, 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 you know, now a lot of times what they're looking at in that situation is, yeah, but we want to get into it or we're on a lake and we can't have the construction site ripped up all summer, or, you know, we have a window of opportunity and this is a lot faster. So there's other aspects than just the energy efficiency that factor into it. But uh, those are all the, I talked earlier about the sacrifices and the decisions that we're making in this process. And that's, that's part of it is playing all those scenarios and just deciding what one is the best for your customer. Sure. But we sure be happy to give you panel numbers on it. And right now um, our lead times are fantastic. Um, yeah. And, and I think we're definitely swinging that way anyway for the time frame because they want to be into it this coming fall and we're actually on a 20,000 square foot home right now we're trying to get done so we can get out there and get it get it going and with the with the efficiency what so one last thing and then I'll sure. quit bugging you until no, the next no, no, meeting think... well what kind of time swing could we see on average from a traditional build to putting the panels up and I'm going to add one more thing in there that I'm really curious about. If we've got a two story, are we looking at Bloom? I'll, I'll say Bloom framing. We'll run that panel all the way to the top and put a ribbon around and suspend that floor in between for the efficiency of the building. We, we can, we don't love it. Uh, okay. I'll tell you what I like on that aspect. Yeah. Uh, I'll take your second question first. Okay. Uh, on that aspect, what, what I really have fallen in love with is building your first floor walls, build them a foot higher than you need them, use oh. top flange hangers, um, and put your floor joists so that they're, they're hanging here. Sure. And now are flush. Now you run your subfloor, your OSB, all the way over to the outside of the, awesome. of the wall. 
set your next wall on top of it and go. So now you don't have any sill cavity, you know, to. We've got um, that thermal break. That's great. You, it, it's just a fantastic way to build. Okay. Now, my first concern about that when I first saw that system was really we're hanging the whole floor system just on hangers. And the engineers are like, oh, this, this, this system, it's the best way to build a house because the hangers are fine. They're designed to do their job. And by the time you put glue and screw the, the subfloor on top of it, that shell is, is really solid. But running your subfloor all the way to the outside edge yeah. It also makes that whole diaphragm just remarkably strong. And so that's a, that's a really cool way to, to do that. And okay. better than balloon from the standpoint of you start getting into wind shears and hanging on, on ledgers and things of that, yep. that nature. And it just works out better for us. Okay. Um, you were asking about uh, time frame as far as, I, I, do you mean how long does it take to well, just on average to what it would take us to frame a, a building of what, whatever square footage you want to say in comparison to, you know, how quickly you can actually put your system together. And I know there's a lot of variables, like you sure. say, but just on an average, like say we're going to build that 40 by 70 or 80 shop you talked about, what kind of time difference can we look at? Well, I'll tell you what SIPA, which is the the national organization that represents many of the SIP companies, their number that they use is this saves 55% on, on wow. your labor time. Okay. Um, that's the number that they have published is 50, a 55% uh, savings in time. My own personal experience at being a builder is I would go into most houses. I had a five man crew uh, typically, and we would go in and if we're talking about, you know, uh, uh, 2,500 square foot, two story, on the, on the first day, we'd build the first floor walls, exterior walls, and start on the floor deck. Second day, we'd finish up the, the, the floor deck and start on second floor walls. The third day, we'd build second floor walls. And on the fourth day, we'd have the crane come and set the roof panels. Wow. And usually in four, four and a half days, we walked away with that shell standing. That's awesome. Um, now, that was a straight forward yeah. project. You're right. There's <laughs> There's jobs that we were on for for you know, two and a half weeks, um, and certainly a 20,000 square foot house that you're working on right now, you're not gonna build in, in one No, and, and it's, it's really but, cut up, yeah. So I got one last thing that I just thought sure. of, I was gonna type in and ask <laughs> earlier. With that roof situation, if we go with that vault, what have you seen or is there an added product as far as using asphalt shingles, or I guess any roofing for heat buildup, if if we don't have, and even the flat roof you talked about and building that substructure, are we worried about a heat buildup that we wouldn't normally get with a truss sheeted roof that we ventilate like that? The the the, the super short answer is is yes. That's that's a concern. The reality is, while this is a hot roof, yeah. um, the shingle companies have looked at it. And they stand behind it. They okay. stand behind uh, their warranties uh, on our roof. Okay. Um, we have letters from GAF and from Certainty, and and they they stand behind it. I'll tell you what's interesting is the ones that have the bigger problem, and it doesn't make any sense whatsoever, is the steel manufacturers. Um, some of them yeah. say, well, it's got to be a ventilated roof, and so they want you to put furring strips up here and, yeah. and make it a cold roof. Um, the the <laughs> In my, in my own personal experience in dealing with those manufacturers, if I bring them physically to my booth or to where I have a display and show them what we're doing, they're like, oh, yeah, that doesn't need to be ventilated. Okay. <laughs> but the first answer when you say, do we have to ventilate this roof? Is, well, of course, you got to ventilate every roof. Okay, but let's, let's talk about what this is. And they don't know hot roof. They don't know the term. And so you, you have to kind of educate that many of them through the process. Um, there is some advantages in certain locations to, to turning this into a cold roof, to putting the furring strips on and ventilating it. Um, we were just having a discussion yesterday morning about ice dams and how if you're in an ice dam prone area, mm -hmm. um, is there a way to avoid that? Not so much from heat loss. You're not going to get ice dams from heat loss and the water getting out to an unheated overhang and freezing up. It's more when there's a big pile up and the sun starts melting it um, and, and it rolls down to the end. Um, that's more common, the more common cause of ice dams on a SIP roof. 
So if you're in an area that's prone to that, you have to, again, go through those pros and cons and decide what's the, the best way for us to make sure our customer loves this. Well, thanks, Sean. I won't tie you up anymore, and I'll see you at the next meeting then. Fantastic. Thanks. Okay. Take care. So I think that's what, all we're going to take for time today. If, if, if that's all right, um, we really appreciate y'all being here. I don't know. How many do we still have on, Lauren? Still 46 participants on. Um, it's really been a pleasure being able to talk with y'all. And like I say, we'll do this again in two weeks. But in the meantime, don't hesitate to reach out to any of us. Um, and you can reach, it doesn't matter if, if you live in the area that I, I personally service, you ask questions. Uh, I love answering questions. We love talking about this and educating you. It's good for all of us uh, to get some of the, the concerns and issues out of the way. So thank you all so much for tuning in. Uh, Joe, anything to add before we sign off? No, not at this time. It, 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 thank you all for, for participating. Um, you were a very engaged audience. Um, Moto Z has one more comment. So I, I'll give him the mic and, and let him ask the question and we'll, we'll see what he has to say here. Sure. Moto Z. Sorry, John, Thanks, this is, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Sorry. I just had, uh, one question about, uh, I, it was kind of explained previously, but I'm planning on doing LP siding, uh, which is rated for SIP and a 26 gauge metal PBR for the roof. Uh, and I was thinking about whether to clad the roof or not. I've talked to 20 different people about cold roof versus, uh, what are your yeah. thoughts on all that? So I'll tell you something that I've, I've really grown to love is a product called GAF um, Deck Armor. It's referred to as a breathable underlayment. And it kind of hybrids the hot roof and the cold roof. It's uh, it's so you don't Joe, have to sheet it out. What's that? John, let me, uh, John, let me uh, just interject. Uh, I'm putting down a uh, an ice and water barrier, the entire roof, um, approximately five thousand square foot. Uh, okay, so. So I'm going to stop you there because I'm going to discourage you from doing that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm going to recommend that you not put the water and ice on the entire roof. Um, I would put it on as code dictates for, you know, a, a foot above your overhang. So you generally two layers uh, of water and ice, but we're going to be happier with your, your end product if you don't put and stick down and that's part of it is putting the adhesive down on the entire thing. Um, we, we want your roof, if it gets wet, to be able to dry to the outside. If there's any moisture that gets to it, we want it to be able to dry to the outside. If you put that water and ice on and seal that, um, that's going to make it hard to do. If any moisture gets under that, it's going to trap it, it's going to hold it, it seals it in. And so I talked about this gaff um, uh, uh, deck armor that is a breathable underlayment, kind of almost like, and don't quote me on this, but it's kind of like Tyvek for your roof. Um, it, it's, it's an, an, an armor, it's a underlayment that will allow vapor through it and allow some, some air movement. And so that's, that's going to be our recommendation to you. Now, uh, again, depending on your climate, depending on your, your particular circumstances and what I would recommend on that is that you talk to your regional sales manager specifically about your location and have them do a little research for you on, on your location. Maybe going with a cold roof is the right thing, but I would, under any circumstances, I would discourage water and ice on the whole, on the whole roof. The, the other aspect to that um, is down the line when you need to uh, re-roof the, the building, with, when you have water and ice, glued down to the whole works, it does damage to the OSB as you're trying to get it off. 
um, that stuff sticks like mad, right? Um, which is a good thing while you want it to stick, but when you want to remove it, it's, it's really, uh, can be an, a, a pain. And so now you don't want to damage that top sheet of OSB because that's part of your structure. So that would be my, my recommendation to you. Joe, what, do you, what would you like to add? Sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> First off, um, I would, Mike, I'd direct you to our, our website on the, the technical bulletin page. Um, technical bulletin 11 talks about um, roofs and the, the idea that John just mentioned. Uh, we need to be able to have the interior OSB, if it gets wet, dry to the interior the exterior OSB dry to the outside if it gets wet. If you follow your steel roof manufacturer's suggestion or requirement of putting down ice and water shield, as John said, that material has a low perm rating, meaning that water vapor does not work its way through that material. Should the exterior OSB skin of the SIP panel get wet, it will stay wet until it deteriorates and then it will no longer be there to get wet. So don't use the ice and water shield the way they're suggesting. What most metal roofing manufacturers, the reason they require the peel, um, ice and water or peel and stick membranes to be applied over the deck is their metal systems leak. And it's the ice and water shield underneath with the low perm rating that keeps the water out from the roof assembly. So in the doc, the technical bulletin, um, it talks about that drying. So a suggested way to deal with the two suggestions that I have with you, and I can send you um, an email that, that outlines this, just let Dawn know and I'll, I'll get it to her so she can get it to you. But one suggested way is you put the, the GAF, um, deck armor down over the top of the SIP. That way it's protecting the OSB of the SIP. Then you would lay um, strips of, of one by material, two by material, so that you create an airspace, resheet the roof with another layer of sec seven sixteenths, and then put the peel and stick membrane on that, that the metal roofing manufacturers are requiring, and then they can fasten directly into that. Should the roof need to be replaced down the road, you can peel the ice and water shield off, um, replace any OSB that's damaged, and you're not damaging the structure of the SIP itself. It's an expensive way to go. As John indicated, it is a cold roof system um, in snow country that does, that also helps mitigate any ice damming that would occur um, from that melting of the snow due to solar effects on the outside. Second option that one could use, and I just found this the other day, um, actually Mandy had a customer that brought it to us, Delta, um, it's Delta Tria, I believe, or Terra, I forget right off the top of my head, it's made by Dorkin, Casella Dorkin, and it's sort of a it's a breathable underlayment with a Brillo pad, a plastic Brillo pad type material attached to it so that it acts as a spacer for the metal. Um, should condensation get underneath the, the metal and drip down onto the underlayment, it can then run down and out. And then it's breathable in the sense that should the OSB get wet, it can dry. I don't know what the cost of that material is, um, but that's another option from that standpoint. So I can get you that information through Don afterward if you'd like, but those are my suggestions from that standpoint. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I'm a, I'm a hundred thousand dollars over on this budget and I'm just looking for ways to keep myself dried in uh, completely not ruin my panels and, uh, and, and do it the smartest way. You know, I was, I was planning on doing the ice and water shield, which talking to you guys, 
you just save me five grand and <laughs> and you'll probably uh and you'll probably cost me seven grand but uh in the, in the end <laughs> in the end i won't have rotten panels right well there's a saying yeah. that it's expensive to do it the first time oh yeah yeah but the yeah, second I have time a, uh, is, the I don't second know time if, is really expensive yeah i have a hundred and sixty thousand dollar uh 60 by 72 concrete pad uh with hydronic heating in it right now that was supposed to cost me 70 grand Well, I think I think really the the part of this process is for you and Don and Joe to continue the conversation and and kind of work through some of this building science because you're right you want to you want to protect your panels you don't want this to be one of those stories that's true you know some people they get a hold of me they talk about well I was reading online about this problem and that problem and I I just point blank with folks some of those stories are true. <laughs> Some of those disasters out there are true. You, 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 it's hard to know from our vantage point which ones are true and which ones aren't. But the reality is it all boils down to uh, installer and building science. And our panels are designed to handle the system. Uh, they work great. Uh, they, 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 they do what they're designed to do, but they have to be handled right. And so you're asking good questions. And you want to follow through on that. And Dawn's, Dawn's your source there. Um, you call her any time of the day or night. You can call her two, three o'clock in the morning. She'd be happy to take your call. So right, she's <laughs> she's actually amazing. <laughs> good, good, glad to hear it. So, is it so since you mentioned technical panel eleven, uh, I think there's an error on your website. I just tried again, and the link there to download it goes to bulletin number 10 not number 11. all right well thank you we'll follow up on that roberta will jump on that and make sure it gets fixed thanks so all right well i think that's all for hands for now i can't see it but i'm being told that that's all it is for hands again thank you all for tuning in and sticking around and, and listening and don't hesitate to email us questions in between we're sitting by our phones we're uh, uh this time of year we don't want to go outside so we'd be happy to sit and talk on the phone. <laughs> so feel free to reach out to us. And until next time, this is Intercept TV, and uh, we will uh, bid you a fair, a, a farewell and a good evening.